Okay. <clears throat> So thank you, Randy, for asking me to talk about spring galaxies. Um, <clears throat> for me, spring is um, April and May have always been galaxy season. Uh, that's when we're looking away from the, the disk of our galaxy, and especially if we've got the fabulous Virgo cluster up there. So um, I'm going to go over some of my favorite galaxies for the spring. Okay. So, what am I, what am I, why am I not advancing here? Using the, I'm using the arrows, right? Down arrow. Okay. I'll use the left button. Okay. Did you get it? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, left it's button. Thank you. You can see I'm not a computer nerd. I'm an, mainly an observer. So. Why should we observe galaxies? Well, almost everything in visible light is a galaxy. So if you don't look at galaxies, you're not looking at almost everything in existence. Now, a caveat to that is um, more masses in dark matter and dark energy rather than visible things. But in, in visible things, if you don't look at galaxies, you're missing almost the entire uh, everything. So, um, okay, going the wrong way. Okay, so why in the spring? Well, I already mentioned, we've got the Virgo cluster. We're looking away from the disk of the galaxy and spring galaxies because it's springtime right now. That's why we're not talking about autumn galaxies when we're looking through the other side of the Milky Way's disk. <clears throat> so I had to make a decision. Um, what galaxies am I going to choose as my favorites? <clears throat> and, I, and I had to think about this. Um, we'll talk about edge-on galaxies, spirals, ellipticals, and irregular. That's the four main types of galaxies. And so my strategy to figure out what to talk about is, um, there are thousands of galaxies that can be visible with an eight inch scope. So how do I choose among all these galaxies and why did I choose the ones that I did? Well, first of all, I excluded the messy objects because they're too famous and everybody knows everything about them. So forget about the Messier. So we're not gonna speak about the M101 in Ursa Major, the pinwheel, which has fabulous spiral arms that you could see their scope that's really high up in the sky. We're not going to talk about the sombrero galaxy that looks like a Mexican hat. It's in Virgo. It's got a dust lane through it. And it's just like its namesake, and it's very bright. And probably the most beautiful, you know, the whirlpool, two interacting galaxies, very bright, close. So we're going to exclude these wonderful objects. We're also going to, I also decided we want to talk about a variety of different galaxies. Now, I talked about spirals, which are face-on and edge-on. So we'll talk about those. We'll talk, We'll have some elliptical galaxies and we'll have a few irregulars. And my final criterion is I'm only gonna talk about galaxies that I have seen myself. Okay. Okay. I think I need um, I need some help getting back to my presentation. Okay. So what did I do wrong? They said I'm not a computer nerd, so. What did you do? Uh, I tried to get the next slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how could I advance? Uh, I have to do, I can use these. Okay, we'll do. Okay, so um, how did I observe galaxies? Well, originally I was using a Celestron eight scope, but more recently in the last 15 years or so, I, I've been using a 14 and a half inch telescope. It's an F4.3. I use eight and 35 millimeter eyepieces and they give me magnifications of 45 times and 195 times. Okay. All right, so just a caveat, um, I have to give credits. 
So um, all the pictures in this um, talk, except the ones that are otherwise indicated, are from the digitized sky survey, which you can read at the bottom um, uh, what it is. Um, I observed these galaxies under Bortle three to four skies, which are a rural sky. And the, the observations are my own observations. Okay. There we go. Okay. So probably the finest field of galaxies in the springtime is the Markarian chain. It is visible. You, you can see it with a small to medium scope. There's more than 10 galaxies visible in one wide field view. And here I'm going to quote from Sky and Telescope, May 2004, Sue French, because she says it better than anyone else could. Strung along a one and a half degree arc that straddles the Virgo coma Bernice's border are eight galaxies known as Mercarian's chain. Two of its members, M84 and M86, were spotted in 1781 by Charles Messier, while the rest are best known by their numbers from um, Johann Dreyer's new general catalog. But the moniker for the whole group arises from a paper titled Physical Chain of Galaxies in the Virgo Cluster and its Dynamic Instability by Russian astrophysicist Benjamin E. Markarian. Okay, I'm going to interrupt here. Um, Sue French is wrong. Markarian is not Russian. He, this is the old Soviet Union, and it's false to assume that anyone in the Soviet Union is Russian. To me, it became very obvious that Markarian is an Armenian name. He's probably from the Armenian Observatory. So I went to Google, and sure enough, yeah, um, it should be an Armenian astronomer. Okay, so let's carry on what she says. Markarian's chain has long been one of my favorite areas for playing a little observational game of seeing how many galaxies I can spot in one field of view. There are many places elsewhere in the sky where quite a few galaxies will fit in a relatively small eyepiece field, but these are generally in the purview of large telescopes. Here in the heart of the Virgo cluster of galaxies, even small scopes can play the game. There are trade-offs in this counting game. A large aperture telescope can show fainter galaxies, but most small scopes can achieve a wider field and encompass more galaxies. By increasing the magnification, we can make a faint galaxy easier to see, um, but this decreases the field of view and spreads its neighbors farther out. Well, in my scope, I can see about 10 galaxies in any given field, both on the, the right part and the left part. Uh, Markarian's chain is right in the realm of galaxies. See, it's between the nebula and um, Virgo. Um, I've oriented the picture so that it corresponds to the way the map is. Note, um, we're going to talk about, um, okay. 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 If, you, if you look at the map, you can see where it says the eyes. We'll talk about that. And also um, look at the, um, okay, look at the lower part where it looks like a face. So. The there's a face figure at the very right. You can see two eyes, a mouth, and an eyebrow. All of these are easily seen in, in an eight-inch telescope. The, the two elliptical galaxies, the Messiers, M84, 86. Okay, so I am talking about two Messiers. Sorry about that. Above um, M86 is an eyebrow, NGC 4402. That's visible in an eight-inch scope. Um, M84 and 86 to me look like bright oval galaxies with bright nuclei. And to the left of the face, um, NGC 4435 and 38, the eyes, you know, a nice pair of galaxies. Now, <clears throat> now we'll talk about these three galaxies. These are one in Leo and two in uh, Coma Berenice. So NGC 2903 in Leo, this is um, in the observer's hand, but this is one of the finest deep sky objects. It's easy to find. It's one of the brightest galaxies in the Northern Hemisphere. It's 20 million light years away. The galaxy itself is slightly smaller than the Milky Way, and it's got lots and lots of star formation in it. There's an oval, bright oval patch to the north part of the galaxy, and you see 2905. That's one of the star forming regions. I was able to see that through my 
um, 14 inch scope. So that's visible when you look at this galaxy. Otherwise it looks like a bright oval. Then one of the finest non-messy galaxies in the entire sky, NGC 40, 4565, it's a huge favorite of mine. I've looked at it many times. It's spectacular, it's edge on, it's long, it's bright. I've, I, you can see there how bright it is. It is very easy to see with a small scope. It's narrow. It's got an oval and a stellar type of nucleus. And when I look at it, I can see what looks like a dust lane or, or a very sharp border um, to the upper left. It's very hard to see that bright part further away from that dust lane. So me, I just see a really sharp border. Um, and if you look carefully, there's a line of stars on the right side, four stars, and they point to faint galaxy NGC 4562. That's also visible in a 14-inch scope, and it might be visible in an 8-inch scope. Now, so these pictures are all showing the same size, like the, the sizes are proportional. So you've got this beautiful little four group of galaxies called the box, very pretty, very striking. Um, they're four spiral galaxies. Three of them are 180 million light years away, but one is a foreground galaxy. The, the foreground one is to the at the very top. Uh, okay, one six nine. And here, um, here's somebody else's um photo of these of these galaxies. So. The blue one is the one that is not uh, part of the um, same cluster. It's closer. So these are my observations of these. One, um, 4169 is a bright oval. 4173, it looks like the faintest of the four, and it looks like a long streak to me. 4174 is small with a bright nucleus, and 4175 is elongated with a bright nucleus. So that, that, that looks like an elliptical, but I, I think it's actually a spiral. Okay, so now we'll go to our next group of galaxies. We're gonna to go to Canis Venetici and we're gonna do a, another uh, Coma Berenice. So this is where they are, and thanks to the observer's handbook for these maps. Okay, NGC 4244 and Canis Venetici. This is called the Silver Needle Galaxy. When, I, when you look at it through a scope, it looks like somebody took a piece of chalk and just drew a line through the sky. just like that. Like, it's amazing. Like it's not round oval, it's just a, it's a bright line, like beautiful, very long and narrow. And I, I can see a slight nuclear brightening when I look at it. It's only 11 million light years away, it's edge on. And I'm gonna compare it. Okay, the next galaxy I'm going to show you is the same distance away. It's also a spiral galaxy, but it's an, a face on. So imagine this one, you're looking at it like this. And the next one I show you will be almost the same thing that's like that. So the next one is 4395, also in Canis Venetici. These are very close together in the sky. The magnitude is about the same. This is a very large, um, it looks very large through my scope. I can see a faint spiral arm to the north. Now, Usually when you look at galaxies, they're just fuzzy blobs. When I looked at this one, I could actually make out that there's a spiral arm. I thought that was so cool. It's, it's, it's also like 15 million light years away. Okay, now we go to this beautiful duo in Canis Venetici, NGC 4490 and 4485. They're an interacting pair 25 million light years away. They interacted um, quite some time ago and the upper one has now moved farther away. Like they've had their interaction and the upper one is moving away. That's 4485. They're, it's very easy to find in the sky. Um, if you know, if you just star hop, you find the star beta kind of an adecorum and it's less than a degree away from that, that star. So it's easy to find. It's very, okay. So the Bigger one is very bright, has a bright nucleus. I, I see it as a narrow oval, elongated east to west, and it has an abrupt border on its north side. The smaller one, NGC 4485, is a small bright oval. Okay, 
And then in coma, coma Berenice, we got NGC 4298-4302. It's a beautiful pair, 55 million light years away. Like when you look at it, it's stunning. You see one that's a straight line and one that's more oval beside it. The round one looks brighter to me when I observe these. Um, these are part of the Virgo cluster. Okay, now we're going to go down. Finally, we're going to get to Virgo and see some Virgo galaxies. Okay, so NGC 4216 in Virgo. Magnitude 10, it's bright, it's long, eight minutes of arc. It's also one of in the finest deep sky objects in the observer's handbook. This one had a bright supernova in it in 19... 94. And it's a, quite a spectacular edge on galaxy, 45 million light years away. I can see a, a bright nucleus when I look at it. Then we've got um, NGC 4526. Um, why did I pick this? Well, this is also in the finest deep sky, but it's really nicely situated right almost exactly between two naked eye stars, and it's very close to Messier 49. It's a bright galaxy. To me, it looks like an elongated oval with a fat center, and it's got a bright round nucleus. Okay, now we get to the Siamese, Siamese twins. I've also seen these two. Lovely. These are two galaxies that have not yet collided, but they are starting to collide, and they're going to merge, and they are... There is evidence of a collision, like radio waves show that the molecular clouds at the boundary of collision is um, acting. So that's where you're seeing the collision, the interaction part of them, but they're getting closer and closer together. So in millions of years, we'll see them like fusing into probably one elliptical. It's a beautiful, easy, um, and easy to see pair through a scope. Um, okay. And you see. 5746. Okay. I'm not, you can see that I love edge on galaxies. As I said, you look at the sky and you see like a white line. It's like somebody drew something on it. Here's another one of those. Like I, I love these guys. Magnificent, almost edge on. It has an abrupt edge to it when I look at it. Okay. Now <clears throat> we're going to some faint stuff. Leo 1. Leo 1 is part of our local group of galaxies. It's it's only 767, only that many light years away. And it's really easy to find if you can see it. It's only 12 arc minutes north of Regulus. So when you look at it, you know, Regulus sort of blinds you. And it's like, this is, this is a, a faint misty patch in the sky. I was really lucky that on one occasion with my 14 inch scope, um, good, you know, really good sky, dark sky, I saw faint hazy patch exactly where it was supposed to be when I moved, only when I moved Regulus out of the field. So the location is easy, but the galaxy is really, really difficult. Um, Leo 1 was discovered in 1950 on a photographic plate of the National Geographic Polymer Sky Survey. And when I did some more research, I found out that it was first detected visually only in the 1990s. So I consider it a real coup to be able to see a little misty patch that I, that I was definitely different from the black sky around it. And talking about really faint and difficult galaxies, I, I couldn't resist putting in this group, the NGC 2929, 2930, 2931 group in Leo, close to the sickle of Leo, far away, 340 million light years away. So from north to south, um, 29, 31, then 30, then 29. Look at their magnitudes, four, about 14, magnitudes 14. Their sizes are one arc minute or less. <clears throat> All three, like with a 14 inch telescope, you could, from a Bordel three sky, yeah, you could see them extremely faint, small, you use averted vision and yes, you have a map, you know, the photo and yes, you know, when you move your eye back and forth. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really there. You know, you have to be sure. So that's these guys. <clears throat> so 
I'm almost finished, but, you know, I finished my presentation. I was going to say the end. And then I thought, no, I've, I've got to, I can't keep my word. I've just got to talk about M51. Like it's just so beautiful. Like NGC 5194, 5195, like magnitude 8.4. Like that's bright. Like eight minutes by seven minutes. That's big. Um, um, the Whirlpool galaxy is a binocular object. Um, you know, with big binoculars, you could see it through binocs. 25 million light years away. It's one of the finest galaxies and galaxy pairs in the entire sky. It was discovered by Charles Messier in 1773. It was described by William Herschel in 1783 and in later years. And the spiral arms and the bridge between the galaxies was described first by Lord Ross in Ireland in 1859. He was using a 72 inch mirror. Um, this, there possibly, it's not really certain, but it's thought that there may have been multiple encounters between these two galaxies that they approach each other and they go farther away and approach each other. And so you see a big tidal tail between them. Is a tidal stream and NGC of 5195, the smaller one at the top lies behind the bigger one. So you can see a spiral arm of the bigger one in front of the smaller one. <clears throat> so the whirlpool, I was really fortunate. Um, I consider this one of my best observing uh, uh, situations ever. Um, on May 9th, 2021, I was at the cottage, like Bortle Sky 3, maybe. And uh, the whirlpool is almost overhead. I pointed my 14 and a half. I wasn't even going to look at this because I've seen it before. And I was, I was going to go home and said, no, you know, the whirlpool is overhead. And, you know, before I pack up, I may as well look at it. So I did. It filled up the entire um, uh, field of my eight millimeter eyepiece, like, the whole eyepiece is just full of these two galaxies. I saw at least two spiral arms, the ones on the left, uh, east and west. I saw the east arm, the one on the left, the one that goes up. It turned north and it split into two parts. I saw a dark area between that arm and, and between the nucleus. And most of the, and I saw most of the arm that are, is between the two galaxies, you know, the one that joins them, I could see that. And I also saw on the, lower right like the west southwest between the nucleus and the other arm i could see a dark lane and i noted a start to the southwest of the nucleus so as i say usually when you see a galaxy just a fuzzy blob but here there was structure there was spiral arms like it was for me this was like just one of my as i say one of my highlights of observing so thank you very much for your attention Yeah. Well, I guess it's all pretty straightforward. Yes, sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, I've always wondered that um, there might be five galaxies naked eye. I've seen M31 and uh, uh, Triangle Galaxy and the uh, Milky Way, of course, and the Magellanic Cloud, which can help any galaxies, whatever. Um, and there are what 3,000, 5,000 stars we can see uh, for the whole thing. But when I look at um, a Hubble picture or a web picture, almost everything is a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And I'm just surprised as we get bigger and bigger, there are more galaxies almost than there are stars. So I, I don't know. And I don't know if you have an answer. So there, there's five. Um... Uh, naked eye galaxies um, and, and, and yeah, I know I'm, I'm doing that's what I'm doing um, Andromeda Triangulum the Magellanic Clouds and the Milky Way galaxy and there's also 3,000 stars naked eye and yet when you look at Hubble pictures almost all of it is galaxies <laughs> well I think um, you know I'm not a super expert anymore than any of us are but I think you know the, the the universe is made up of billion like billions and billions of galaxies, as Carl Sagan said. And 
um, I think Hubble has a very narrow field of view. So, um, you know, th that's why that's why you're not seeing a huge number of stars in extremely, like you're looking at with a straw up at the sky. So there are not gonna be many stars in that straw, even faint stars, but there will be many of these billions upon billions of galaxies. I, I think that might be my best explanation for that. Um, yeah, Keith. Sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot of them. I, uh, I have a life list of things that I've seen. Um, I've got a whole list of things um, um, have to see again. I, I can't immediately think of a, a particular one of them, but yeah, there, there are lots of those. Um, I, I've seen um, by star hopping in my long lifetime, uh, 1,233 galaxies. I actually um, looked, at, looked at that. Um, and there's many that galaxies that I've tried to see and I haven't been able to, and I have to do them again. And I don't know how long my lifetime will go on and I'll be able to. I, th I think John was gonna ask me something. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I thought somebody would ask them, so I looked up the number, uh, 1,233. <laughs> uh, when I saw my thousandth galaxy, I. I put a big star beside a 1,000th galaxy, and I don't right now remember which one that was, but it's in my logbook somewhere. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, you know, a lot of people are imagers. I, I'm terrible at imaging. I, my everything is blurry. Like I've just given up, but I just love observing things. I mean, that, that's my thing. What can I say? <laughs> Yeah. Um, when I when I go to the southern hemisphere, for whatever reason, I make sure it's new moon, and I take a teleview scope. And every clear night that I can, um, I go. I'm I'm out there and you know, observing. Um, one one of my best nights was in um, Australia in the Blue Mountains, where my wife's cousin has a house and nice dark skies. I spent hours on the Magellanic clouds, just picking out. Um, clusters that are in the Magellanic Clouds, and I logged about 40 of them in the LMC and SMC. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I generally I just go up to the cottage or to Starfest or the car observatory of um, Algonquin Park. I've been when they had the Algonquin Star Party. But, yeah, when you go south, you carry a small scope and see what you can. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think I'm next, but um, I don't know if the computer will affect the raw file because I want to share the question. Oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah, at least I just pull it out. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. 
Presume my water. Oh. oh. Yeah, you have done chair, right? You have done chair. Okay. One, two. Okay. Yes, so get your name. No, I don't see how to get all of my. Uh, so get your picks up. Okay. And there's better tails. All right, so I'll start with the PowerPoint that is yep. opening, but maybe I have, oh, there we are. Okay. All right. I can't read. No. Oh, I know what the problem is. Um, The version I saved was to okay good okay now just start that. You're, you're laughing. You're all set. Okay, sorry to you're delay there. there. Well, I was going to face people. No, then I could see them fall asleep. Whatever you want. All right. Um. Oh wait a minute. Can people see me now with? Is your camera? Supposed? No, it's not on. There's some. You flick this back and forth, or can they just they know what you look like. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Um, I, I heard a guy who takes amazing astrophotos, and these are ones where he has. I think it's a telescope this big around. Uh, that's like a 16 inch, and. Um, does you know 50 images of two minutes each and then a different color and another 50 and a different color and another 50 and then does massive computer work to combine them all together to get the beautiful images that Chris showed etc although you know absolutely stunning images and he's won awards from them and he said when he's showing photos to a group the strongest reaction oh, what's happened there sorry the strongest reaction is to do a photo with a piece of earth in it. And I personally like astrophotos that have a, wait a minute. I have to hook up this. Uh, I personally like astrophotos with a, a piece of earth in them. And um, if I'd looked harder, I would have found uh, uh, an REST star trail, but I was putting this together in a hurry. Um, what I really want is to get an astrophoto, um, a star trails through a barn. 
And I think it, I, I love derelict barns. They, they um, uh, my father said a lot of them get destroyed because people buy the farm and they don't keep animals in anymore. And without the heat of the animals, the foundations frost heave, and um, a lot of barns are falling apart. And I love these derelict barns. And this one is maybe 30 minutes away from Bolton. And fortunately, there were also a flock of geese. So I love getting a pictures of them flying there through. And if I could somehow get a long enough star trail going through the barn to see a curve and then it's covered by the barn and then you see it go through, that, that would be really, really wonderful. And I'd like to try for that. Um, anyway. Uh, this barn's a fair drive away, and I saw it during the day, and actually I turned around, and it's hard to find a parking place that's safe. So I parked the car, and I walked in, and there was a laneway that was open, so I walked in the laneway. It's, I know it's private property, but I did it anyway. And I had my camera with me, and I took these pictures, and I even planned exactly where I wanted to set up my tripod when it was dark on a moonless night that's clear, and those are relatively rare. <clears throat> so anyway... Um, I was driving past again during the day, and I saw that uh, somebody had put fences up, and I thought, okay, and I found I could crawl underneath the fence and get in and get my stuff in, and I could set it up, and, and I had everything set up, and then um, it took about a month later when the conditions were just right, and I drove from home at sunset and got there, and there were cows in the area. And I thought, cows are contented and happy, and I'm a chicken. So I decided I wouldn't go in with great frustration. So I, drew, I didn't have my telescope with me. I just had my camera ready to go, uh, all set up to take a 30-second you know, click and then automatically in the next one. And uh, anyway, uh, I was chicken, so I didn't go in. And uh, later on, I have a friend who's an egg expert, and he said he knows somebody who got three broken ribs because cows weren't happy and they just attacked suddenly. I didn't think that was a situation, but anyway. Here's another barn. And it's actually only 15 minutes away from Bolton, but it's south of the town. So you can imagine what the light pollution is going to be. And it was recently bought by somebody who put up big fences all the way around it. And, um, uh, I snuck in and I know I can get through and I might try it, but there's no place I can conveniently park nearby and I don't want the police to investigate. So uh, I gave up on that. Now, this one is my most frustrating one because it cost me an RESC calendar because I was driving past this beautiful barn and it turned out that uh, I saw somebody driving out, so I waved at him and I chatted with him. And these people had just recently bought the farm. And I explained what I wanted to do. And it was a beautiful barn. And for some reason, I can't find a picture of it with all sorts of holes in it. It was just perfect. Then I came a few weeks later when conditions were right. And unfortunately, the um, um, uh, it was cloudy. Now, what I should have done, it was patchy cloudy. So I decided from a distance to just take general pictures of the sky, but I should have walked right into it because I'd planned exactly where I was gonna set up my tripod. And I even did a little bit of digging to move crap, well, stuff out of the way to make a place. Then I found it another night and I thought it was good, but it was cloudy. And then the next time I went to it, they demolished the barn. So I have a good record for these things. I found a barn driving on Highway 400 going to Barrie, and I just noticed it, and I figured on the way home, and I found where it was, and I drove in, and it's very close to the highway, so there's probably light of, of cars, and there's also a house right next to it, and I kind of don't like to you know, interrupt people when they're, when they're there. Then. I found a barn actually only 10 minutes from home and it's right next to a gas station. So the lights on all night. And one night I figured I'm going to try it. And I don't know if you can see the mouse, but you're going to see this star here. And what I'm going to do is to 
close my PowerPoint and I'm going to through and I'm going to go through the rest of my uh, bad luck. So close PowerPoint and I'm going to start from here. All right. Uh oh. Is there some way I can close the windows on the side or put them elsewhere because I want to advance? Randy, do you know how to use PowerPoint or uh, Zoom? So I don't want the pictures of people there. There is there another place I can put it? Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. Maybe I can do that. Okay, yeah. good. Sorry about that. So here's the photo, and um, uh, it, it for so many different processes. But we're watching this star right here, and it's moving down. And these are four thirty-second images, so it's basically two minutes apart, and it's going down past the tree. And I was thinking, hey. This is the time. I'm going to make it. And then a problem happened. I don't see anybody sympathetic for my plight of not kidding. <laughs> anyway, th this was in um, uh, the March time when it was, the, and I wasn't totally surprised, but. Uh, that's my experience, and uh, I think I'm at the limit of my pictures, and uh, wow. Anyway, I'm still trying. If anybody knows a barn that is really holy, that is preferably closer to Bolton than, you know, like relatively easy to get to from Bolton, I would be grateful. And uh, I got inspired to start it again from the pictures that Robin included in her talk, well, anyway, a while ago, and... Um, so uh, I think, and I think I've got to every picture here. Yeah. So that's it, unless there are any questions. And, and I hope, Chris, you don't ask me something I totally can't answer. But no, I was curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. Ron Swapna here. What, uh, where is this barn that you were able to see the Northern Lights from? Um, this one is about five kilometers north of Bolton, uh, right next to a gas station. And the brightness of the plant, of the, of the barn, depended on whether um, the lights were on or off, because when somebody would happen, anyway, the light changed, and sometimes headlights were there. So it's just a little north of Bolton. Amazing. Thank you. I'm sorry? That amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks. Thank Thank you. Okay, let's take a break so that we can set up the next two talks, please. This is truly the reward that's so far down. There's yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with good luck down there. I just pressed on chair. And, oh, oh, leave meeting. Yeah, I'll leave the meeting and I'll just stay here, but I'll leave the meeting. I'll I am unmuted. You can hear me. All right, that's good. Well, hello everyone. Just a little side. I'm gonna talk about this book that uh, I uh, have uh, recently gone through. And I got this book. I was uh, Googling because I, me being eternally curious, or if uh, you speak to my spouse, my wife will tell you that I am terminal attention deficit disorder. Mm, but uh, I was uh, Googling one day and I said, you know, I wonder, you know, I, how do we figure out, I was reading about exoplanets and I was trying to figure out how do we know the mass of these exoplanets just from its orbit? So I said, math behind calculating orbits. And this book came up. So I ordered it. It came in the mail. My wife picked it up. She looks at this and she goes, you got an explanation. You're not going back to school, are you? And I went, no, I'm just curious. And that's when she told me, yep, you are a geek. And I told her, you knew that when you married me anyways. So this book, all righty, why is it not advancing? Cursor down. There we go. 
So the questions I, I was asking, how do we know the temperature of a star? You, you read it in the, you know, and it says oh, the surface temperature of the star is 5,500 Kelvin. How do we know that? Yeah. Or the mass of a planet, it's orbiting at this rate around a star. We don't know the mass of the star. We don't know the mass of the planet, but people figure it out. How do we do that? So then distance to a celestial object. You know, you've got uh, the Gaia mission and it's telling you how far these stars are out to a hundred light years. Okay, parallax has got to be awfully small. So how do we do this stuff? We apply physics and mathematics. And there's a, been a ton of smart people through since, uh, since Ptolemy to now that have come up with methods to do it. So this book covers that stuff. And it's got chapters on the fundamentals. So a lot of the strong astronomical calculations are based on ratios. So you work on ratios. So like, for instance, a lot of things are measured in astro astronomical units or the mass of the sun. So you do ratios to compare the mass of an object to the mass of the sun. So it gives you some fundamentals on that. And then my bugaboo, scientific notation, all those 10 to the plus six or 10 to the minus six and keeping track of that. But it gives you a bit of fundamentals on that. And also uh, it makes up for the fact that I uh, haven't done any mathematics since the dark ages. So then we get into gravity and it discusses Newton's laws and Newton's equations in English, which is really kind of neat. And it gives some great examples on that. Then we get into light. You know, how do we know the surface temperature of a star? So it goes into things like uh, Stephens and Stephens the law and Wien's law. And if you can find out what the peak wavelength of a star is, you can calculate its temperature. Then we get into parallax. So how does Gaia measure this? Well, and what's the trigonometry behind it? And then the book goes into stars. And so how do we measure the evolution of a star? It talks about uh, the Hertzsprung-Russell uh, diagram and so, some of those things on stellar evolution. And then it gets in the interesting stuff, extreme physics, you know, black holes, what happens at the event horizon, cosmology. You know, I took a course in university that was all on relativit relativistic physics. There's a phrase. You know, if you're, you're flying along at 0.9, the speed of light, and somebody is standing in a different reference frame, you know, how much is your, your uh, dimensions dilated? How much does your time change for that? And it was a whole semester of just having my mind twisted and uh, adjusting my concept of reality. And the great thing about this book is there's no differential or integral equations in it. Which for me, since I got a whopping 55% in first year calculus, <laughs> and I was absolutely ecstatic about that because I knew that, great, I don't have to take it again. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's worked well. And it has great examples in it. So this is Kepler, an example of Kepler's laws. You know, Kepler was a really smart guy. He was a little weird, but he figured out that, you know, orbits aren't circular, they're ellipses. And then he figured out the relationships between the orbital period and the eccentricity. So how, how non-circular the orbit was and a bunch of calculations you can figure out. And it's got a website. So uh, you can go there and if you want even more problems to go through, they got them there. And if you get stuck, with the problem that's in each chapter ends with a, a set of problems that you can work through to test what you've learned about. And if you want more, they're on the website, or if you get stuck, the answers aren't in the back of the book, they're on the website. Anybody remember, I told my son that, my son is uh, in uh, fourth year, and I said, you know, we used to look in the back of the book for the answers, and he looked at me and goes, he, he went through all of high school, most of university without a textbook. Everything's online. So totally different paradigm. He says, you just look up the answer. And it's, well, they used to be back in the book when we used books. But the website's great. You can find them out. And it's got references. If you find something in there that's interesting that you want to learn a little more about, 
it's in there. And the problem, you know, each chapter has a set of problems you can work through. And here's an example, and I'm going to make you all do some math with me. So, you all ready? So we got an example from the gravity chapter. How far from the center of the Earth is the International Space Station if its orbital period is 92 minutes? So we know its orbital period is 92 minutes. So how do we do that? Well, if we get stuck, we can go to the website, but we're not gonna get stuck. We're gonna do it. So we can do assume one thing, that the, the orbit of the International Space Station is almost perfectly circular. So we can assume that the center of the Earth is what Kepler calls the, and the distance from the International Space Station to the center of the Earth is the semi-major axis, of which Kepler gives the letter A to. And then we can use Kepler's third law, which is the period squared equals the semi-major axis cubed divided by the mass of the two objects you're dealing with. Am I you keeping with me here? <laughs> all right. And this is where you need all that ratios and uh, scientific notation, because for this uh, equation to work, it needs to be in years. So you got to work the 92, convert the 92 minutes to what fraction of the year it is. So you end up with 1.75 times 10 to the minus four. And the mass is in solar masses. And you can ignore the mass of the International Space Station because it's a rounding error when you compare it to the mass of the Earth, because the Earth is pretty big. So the Earth is three times 10 to the minus sixth of the mass of the sun. So we put it all in there and we arrange the equation to solve for a cubed. So we get a cubed. So the semi-major axis cubed equals the period squared times the mass. So then we end up with that equation and it spits out a number that says 4.5 times 10 to the minus fifth. So what is that? That's 4.5 times 10 to the minus fifth of an astronomical unit. So one astronomical unit is 150 million kilometers, the average distance between the earth and the sun. So then you would do the math and it works out to it's 6,750 kilometers. So the distance from the International Space Station to the center of the earth is approximately 6,750 kilometers. And we know the radius of the earth is on average 6,378. I even remember that from uh, my geology, my undergraduate degree is in geology. So back in the dark ages, I knew that. <laughs> So we know that the International Space Station is orbiting 6,750 6, kilometers above the center of the Earth or 372 kilometers on average above the surface. So I learned how to do that from this book. So if you wanna get the book, you can either order it from that website or this is the page from Indigo and they're charging 31.95 for it. So if you're a geek like me and a little curious about how all this math works in a digestible component, you know, because as soon as uh, you get into multivariable calculus, the rest of my hair goes out. So buy the book, if you're curious. And that's the end of my pre presentation. I just found it interesting, so I thought I would share it with you. So thank you. <laughs> And if anybody wants to take a look at the book, you can just pass it around. So uh, you can just take a look at the chapters. Yeah, it is. It is more textbook. Okay. Question. I do. I didn't do it. It's not my fault. Isn't your hair big? So is it quite? Far from being an actual year? Uh, the, yeah, the Earth, the best way to describe it is because of uh, uh, orbital uh, centrifugal motion uh, uh, forces. The Earth is actually like you take a basketball and you squish it, 
So it's shorter between the poles and uh, wider uh, around the equator. And the mass, mass is not evenly distributed. J2 Zo Wilson, when he uh, put forward his theory on continental drift, tried to convince the world, and that was only in, in the early 60s that he worked on trying to do that, convince the world that the continents move. Most of the continents are now in the Northern Hemisphere. So there's actually a little more mass in the Northern Hemisphere of the Earth than there is in the South. So there's the answer to your question. No, the Earth is not round. <laughs> but for the purposes of the math we were doing, the Earth is round. <laughs> uh, yes, he did. Yes, he did. And he was considered a heretic. But uh, when I studied geology back in the Dark Ages, uh, he was pretty well proven right. But they were still debating it. They were saying, we're not sure. They still called it a plausible theory. But uh, discovering uh, so many other things, you know, and once GPS satellites came in, you can even measure the centimeters per year movement of uh, the North uh, of Europe moving away from North America. Sorry, long winded answer. You asked me, you actually asked me something I knew. So thanks, Chris. <laughs> All righty. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so we're now going to set that up for Mateo. For Mateo, excellent. Uh, okay, no, but if you use that mic, if you use that microphone, then it's going to kick into the camera associated with this, right? So we want to mute. Okay, so uh, hopefully everyone can hear me at home. Uh, somebody, yeah, hello, hello. Okay, uh, so we're gonna set Mateo up. The problem is the camera in the room here, we can't get it to link to the Zoom. So we're going to set up Rob's laptop and have it point at Mateo. And he's going to essentially give a talk um, using Rob's laptop, but it's not a share. So what we want to do is we want to view uh, by speaker and hopefully uh, Mateo's picture will show up. Um, so if you have one over here, you'll be able to present my screen. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to mute, I'm going to mute this sec session. Anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Rob. It's just echoing. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Uh, just the echo. We'll try again. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. sounds really good, actually. Well, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. We can hear you fine. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I know, but I, I should come through. I'm oh, actually coming through here. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me, Swapna? Yeah, perfectly. Actually, okay, with, perfect. Yeah, yeah okay. with the headset. Excellent. Yeah, headset's right. better. So the trick is. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, that's because I. Yeah. All right. So the reason right. for that. So everyone has to mute at home, essentially. Except for Rob. Uh, can you still hear me, Swapna? Hello. Yeah, I can. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so everyone's muted. So your picture is coming. Through. And you can see yourself. That how cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the question is, so is Mateo going to put the, uh, no, you can't use that. Yeah. Oh, you, I didn't know you had a. Oh. Yeah, I said, yeah, bring a USB stick. Oh, uh, yeah, you can do that. Okay, all right, Although, uh, need a few more minutes here, folks. To yeah, I need a way to put band 
get to the slide as well. All right, you're going to have to be flexible with us here. Um, yeah, your PowerPoint's on here. Yeah. It's, Tell me how this is going to work. So I say some things, I advance, um, advance the slide, and I'm also using like animations, not animations, but okay. can, you, can you do the present, the PowerPoint first, and then the telescope next? Yeah. Oh, so when you mean that, you mean like actually showing the telescope? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I could do that after one, we're doing questions and answers. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not all right. I, I'm sorry. I'm under the impression that it, it's here and you're going to give a presentation with the telescope. Well, it's nice to have it in view, but oh, okay. it's not necessary. Oh, okay. Not you can just get it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> sorry for the. No, that's okay. I, I assume. Uh, <laughs> all right. So. Uh, Uh, okay, I have to unmute this. So why am I not getting anything here? One, two, three. Oh, sorry, my fault. One, two, three. All right, can you uh, thingy that? I'll put it on your little call here. That's All right. And uh, stick that in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. All right. So you are left and right first year here. Whenever you're ready. All right. Do you want the lights down a little bit? Uh, yeah, that will work. All right. John can do that. All right. Sorry for the delay, folks. I think we're going to be good. Okay. All right, let's begin. So, my name is Matteo Sadi, and today I'll be presenting about the mystery of the Marsh Telescope. So, to begin, we must head on over to the Aberfoyle Antique Market. So, the Aberfoyle Antique Market is an antique show that runs every Sunday during the year. And I'm talking about it because I very much enjoy going there, and it relates to our story. So back in 2021, I was going there for like my many a time, and I ran into one of the vendors. His name is John Vanderkoff. He is the owner of A1 Antiques, and he is very important to the story. Basically, what happened was I talked to him, and, and we got to know each other quite a lot, and I ended up actually volunteering for him a couple of times. And during my volunteering sessions with him, I mentioned how I love astronomy and telescopes. And so fast forward a bit to June of 2022, I was current at the time, I was actually in Nashville, Tennessee in the United States for an internship related to physics and astronomy. And during that time, in the middle of June, there was actually a special showing that was happening at Aberfoyle where even more vendors showed up to sell even more things that are even harder to find. And on the nights before 
the show started, uh, Johnny was walking around at, because he was setting up for the show and he happened to come across a telescope for sale and he immediately thought of me. And so the night before, while I was just relaxing in Nashville, I got a message from him with this picture on the left. Uh, pictures on the right are extra pictures I want to show, but the one on the left is what I got. And as soon as I saw it, I was in love and I had to get it. <laughs> and so uh, I managed to get into contact with the seller and before the show even started, and that involved waking up at 6 a.m. and staying up for three hours straight, uh, I purchased the telescope and all was good. So the seller said, said the following. He said he purchased it from a Toronto estate sale, although unfortunately he does not remember either the estate owner or exactly where in Toronto it was sold, which is unfortunate. And judging from the pictures alone, I could tell that the diameter of the telescope was around five inches and it was also around six feet long. So moving on to August of 2022, I finally finished my internship and went back home to Ontario. And I not and the first the very first thing I did was look at the telescope and tried to find more about it as the pictures didn't show any inscri inscriptions or markings or anything. And so starting off, I looked at the lens. It was dirty, but the great thing which surprised me was that there was no scratches, no blemishes, and barely any mold on it. So if I could clean it, then it could be usable, which is amazing. Continuing on, you could actually see if I move back, if I move back here, if you look at the top left of the top picture, you could actually see a part of a stamp. And the other parts are around there as well. And as it turns out, this stamp dated here from 1903 to 1908 of Edward of King Edward VII. It was actually used as a spacer, which is actually somewhat common out of, of like the early 1900s to 1800s for amateur telescope making. Moving on, we have two very interesting things that you do not see in many telescopes. One is that the tube is painted black, a glossy black paint on brass, which is something you do not see very often. And another interesting thing are these aluminum parts, both for the cell as well as the focuser. It is unclear whether or not these are original parts, but after look, taking a close look at the detail, especially at the cell, I say it probably is original because it has all the markings of the rest of the telescope that is not aluminum. Moving on, we have an eyepiece. Apart from the box, the telescope, and some, and this, you know, extra part I showed earlier, which I still do not fully know what it is, the eyepiece was still there and it was labeled 1.414. At first, I didn't really know what that was, but after comparing that eyepiece with others I had, as it's a one and a quarter inch diameter, I thought, I figured out that 1.414 is actually the diameter, is actually the focal length in inches of the eyepiece. As comparing it to my 25 millimeter eyepiece, I could tell it is a much wider view. Continuing on, we have the dew shields. As you can see here, we have a lot of corrosion, green and gray. But what's also on the dew shield are these really well-made custom leather dust caps, which are finely stitched and are very sturdy and are still in amazing shape. Continuing on, we have these very large mounting screws. I measured them to be around half an inch in diameter, which is very large. And another interesting fact is that when trying to figure out uh, nuts to put on it, to hopefully try to mount it onto a modern mount, I was unable to because no matter which nuts I tried at half an inch of diameter, I just couldn't find any. So I think it may be unique threading of some sort. 
After some time has passed, I finally decided to open up the cell and to look at the lenses. And the first thing I noticed are these penciled markings for alignment. So as you can see on the left in this bottom picture, there's uh, markings for both aligning the lenses to each other, as well as aligning the lenses to the spacers, which is very clever. So after some even, even more time has passed, and I thought, okay, I got to clean this telescope. I do not like how it, there's so much dirt on it, and I'm just letting it sit there. But the, here's the problem. I have no experience in cleaning telescopes. So I, I had to find someone who does know, and it wasn't too easy. But after some time has passed, talking to a few people, I finally found a person, and his name is Henry Leparskis. So Henry Leparskis runs the um, Hugh Cron Observatory in Western University, and that hosts a 10-inch refractor. And he's used to cleaning that lens, so he has a lot of experience. And so he decided, as he enjoys antique telescopes, he went all the way from London, Ontario to Milton, Ontario, where I live, to help me clean and to teach me how to clean it in the future. So his solution was to use a bath of isopropyl alcohol and distilled water, as well as constantly washing it with that, with those two and just tap water. And then finally, to finish it off, he even made this 10 degree drying stand, which is an optimal angle to dry at the fastest rate as well as leaving the least residue. And as you can see in this comparison picture, it turned out amazing. And I have to thank him for that to this day. Continuing on, I decided I have to figure out who made this telescope because apart from the 1.414 and the eyepiece, there are no markings on this telescope whatsoever. And so the first option I, I thought of is to go to the Cloudy Nights Forums group. So if you haven't heard of the Cloudy Nights Forums group, it is a very, very large forums group dedicated to astronomy. And there are many people with tons of knowledge on telescopes. And so I talked to the people on the forums for a while, but I couldn't get any clear answers. Got some, a few leads, a few similarities, but nothing perfect. But one thing I did get was a, was a link to a different forum group, which is the Antique Telescope Society forums. So these people specialize in antique telescopes and they're extremely knowledgeable. For instance, two of the things that I talked about earlier had to be thanked from the people from this forums group, such as the stamp being identified as well as finding Henry, as Henry is actually a member of the Antique Telescope Society forums. But, even with all that, I couldn't find a telescope maker, although I did find the lens maker, which is a, by the man named John A. Brashear. He is not the most popular lens maker of his time, which is the mid to late 1800s, as well as early 1900s. But he did make many telescopes and telescope lenses, and people loved them. But as I said earlier, no leads on who made the telescope. But then a few members thought, oh, the stamp in, uh, used as a spacer is Canadian. I'm Canadian. I bought the telescope in Canada. So this, that, this all probably means that this telescope is Canadian made. And so thinking of that, he referred me to a man named Randall Rosenfeld. So what I'm supporting about him is that he runs the RSC archives, which archives, well, many important RSC events people, instruments too. And so when talking to him and showing him pictures, he thought of a few things in the archives that could be related to what I have here. And so while looking through the archives, I got my Eureka moment. So what is this Eureka moment? Well, that came when I saw three pictures. The first being this picture, the second being this picture, and especially the third being this picture. Well. When I saw that third picture especially, I immediately compared it to what I had. So move the telescope, move that picture to the side, got a picture of my own, move my picture around, and then merge them together. And as you can see here, a near perfect match. 
And so when I saw that, I thought, okay, this is probably it. And the person who made this telescope is the Reverend Daniel Brand Marsh. So who is Daniel Brand Marsh, you may be asking? Well, for starters, he is actually the founder of the RSC Hamilton Center, as well as the now defunct Guelph and Peterborough Centers. Another interesting fact is that he participated in many eclipse expeditions, a lot of which are actually funded by the government of Canada and was very important for Canadian astronomy. And on top of that, he also became a, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, not of Canada, but the original one in, in Britain. So now that I finally got a name to the telescope, I thought I have to find more. I have to find more links and connections. And to start off, I went to the Westfield Heritage Village. Now this village many years ago loaned out telescopes from the Hamilton RSC and they had many Marsh telescopes that were, get, that were borrowed by them. And so a man named Peter Lloyd helped me out and he even gave me a private tour of the place to take a look at the telescopes. And I decided to bring my telescope along as well. And as you could see in this comparison picture, they're both, they're really close to each other. Mine is on the left. Continuing after that, I found this. So as it turns out, the gravestone of Marsh is very unique. As when I went there, I realized it is unlike any other gravestone in the graveyard because that metal plate you see is completely custom. And if you look very, very closely near the top, you could see a telescope, just like the picture I showed earlier. Amazing. And what's even more amazing is just five minutes drive from the gravestone is this the Hamilton Public Library. And in their archives, they host many Marsh-related pictures and documents, such as these pictures he took through one of these telescopes of the sun and the moon. And what's even cooler that was also in the archives was this picture here, which is the first record obtained, first perfect record obtained of a solar eclipse, which was taken in one of those eclipse expeditions I talked about earlier. And if you look at the bottom two pictures, you could see what's called the Marsh Triscope, where you put three telescopes on one mount to get as many pictures of po as possible of the eclipse. And as you could see, the largest one bears close resemblance to, to my telescope and the other ones I've shown earlier. After some time has passed since being at the Hamilton Public Library, I came across a man named Rob Allen. He's actually a a member of the Hamilton RESC. And what's important about him is that back in 2008, he actually did an orbit article about, about Marsh and, and he wanted to find out more about him and his telescopes. And as it turns out, despite that article being so old, his email still worked, that was linked. And so I talked to him for a while and he told me that his son also made telescopes and that he had a brochure that of his advertisements of these telescopes. And as you could see here, these telescopes are also similar to the one I have and the ones I've shown earlier. So now we have two possible marshes that could have made this telescope. And so that's something I still need to figure out on top of everything else. And so that leads us to our final question, which is when was it made? Well, we have two walls of time of when this could have been made. The start being the stamp and the end being his death from 1903 to 1933. And, the, and that is where our presentation leads off for today. Thank you very much for watching. Excellent, Mateo. And uh, a little Randall Rosenfeld who was actually on the Zoom. Oh, I didn't even realize. Thank you very much for joining. Yeah. Any questions? All right. The question is, have I used the telescope? Uh, just two days ago, I've used it for the third time. And let me just say, it is worth the trouble of moving that huge telescope around. 
Was that River Wood? Yeah, that was the second time. But actually, two just two days ago, I actually went to a a, a members only us. Oh, no, it was actually public. It was like a small star party hosted by RSC Hamilton. And if you could believe it, at their observatory, right beside the actual dome, the Roloff Dome, there's a, a building called the Marsh Building. <laughs> yeah, and that's, and it's like coming full circle. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, no, I, I wish I had the expertise of, uh, sorry. The question is, have I built a mount for it? The answer is no, because I do not have the expertise of building my own mount. But uh, what I ended up doing would, was um, taking out the uh, mounting, those large mounting screws I showed earlier. And, the, and I'm glad I did this because I'm, do, I'm, I'm glad I did it in a way where it's not damaging to the telescope. But what I did was I bought uh, mounting rings just like, yeah, two brings that are around the same diameter, putting it on safely, and then getting a, a bar, just a dovetail bar, and then putting it just on a modern go-to mount. Any more questions? Okay, Mateo, right. thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry for the mix up. Okay, uh, our next meeting is in two weeks in this room. Uh, our speaker will be in this room. So if you're on Zoom, why don't you uh, come and meet the speaker? Um, our speaker is Ryan Cloutier, and he's from Hamilton, from McMaster University. And he's going to talk about inhabitable world. So it's gonna be a life in the universe. So that should be interesting. Um, any announcements? I don't think we have anything uh, pressing. Don't forget the uh, picnic is coming up. So it's like June 10th, Saturday, June 10th. So definitely mark that on your calendar. And uh, if that's it, then I will close the meeting. Thanks very much. <clears throat>